I am Vactor, and this is the Vector Verse. My guest today is a legend in the comic book podcasting world. He is the resident encyclopedia of superhero knowledge. He's been reading comics since 1982 and gained the title of Trivia Geek from working on an extensive trivia game, which now boasts over 3,600 questions. He's single-turn Dutch Scorpio, enjoys late nights dancing Swedish fish and long walks off short piers. It is my pleasure to welcome Mr. Peter Rios. Welcome to the Vectorverse, sir. Wow, Justin, that, that's just <laughs> incredible what you managed to pull out. And, you know, because you mentioned the trivia thing, I realized... Here is the original, one of the original Trivial Pursuit, comic book Trivial Pursuit boards that we oh. created. I realized I had it stashed away. I was like, oh, wait a minute. I have oh, that. Put that in the museum. Put that in the I comic know. book museum. That How is going to be a collector's item. I'm doing very well, and I'm very happy that you are here to join me today. Now, first off, I want to start by saying that I would not be here today. If it were not for you, Mr. Brian Deemer, and Comic Geek Speak, because when I first got into podcasting in 2005, actually, double, there's a double, uh, double entendre here. So okay. not only podcasting, but when I got back into comic books after I kind of got out due to girls and sports and things, and I was like, all right, I'm going to put comics away for a little bit. But what brought me back was the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man. Okay. Ultimate Spider-Man and Comic Geek Speak. I nice. forever will be thankful to all of those things because when podcasting hit Apple, I was like, all right, what can I search for? Oh, podcasts. And I don't know why, but yours popped up and just the, the dulcet tones of Mr. <laughs> uh, Deemer and Mr. Rios together. And then the crew that formed, um, it just, it was like magic to me. And I didn't have any friends who were into comic books. So listening to you guys and you already had your group together and um, mm -hmm. all of those years of reading comics, but also your knowledge. I was like, oh, I didn't know this book. I, I had never heard of this book. So 100%, I am here today because of you and Comic Geek Speak. So I got to say a big thank you uh, for inspiring that, uh, lighting that fire under my nice. belly all those years ago. So thank you, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, we always like to say we... We were building a, a podcast one listener at a time. That was our tagline, right? <laughs> but we were also emptying wallets by the thousands of <laughs> people who said, I got back into comics because of you, just like your story, or uh, I now own all of this because of your recommendation. And it worked yes. both yes. ways. I mean, we got into Walking Dead because of the listeners, you know, so it did go both ways. But um, so, your first podcasting venture was 2005? Yes, and I started an Xbox podcast. That was my very first podcast. Um, I actually joined another um, nice. friend who had started an Xbox podcast. But then 2007, I moved to Memphis, and I started Geekland. And that was when I, I think I was contacting you guys. I was leaving emails mm -hmm. and messages. Mm -hmm. um, but you guys helped me out a lot on Geekland, um, just kind of – the example and the inspiration of what to be like. And then also you guys were so nice. I wanted to find it, but it's buried away in one of my hard drives. You did a bumper for me and oh. it's actually, it's Murd doing his Elvis impersonation. And he's like, I'm going to geek land. I wanted to find it and play it, but um, I wasn't able to locate it. It's in one of my archives somewhere, but I'll try to find it before hey, this. If, if you were podcasting in 2005, you are pod class of 2005. That's a, that's a, a high mark for, because podcasting only started at the end of 2004, like middle to end of 2004. So most people say 2005 is sort of like that birth year, but that's great. If you can, you know, put that on your resume, that's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> I mean, we yeah. knew you prior to your family. I don't know how much you talk about your family, but we knew you before all that, which yes. is so yes. amazing. Yeah. So I was um, I, like, I've grown with all of you guys and um, CGS, like it, it boggles my mind that the number of episodes, when I look at it, I'm like, this, this is like, I never thought, I, I guess I never thought about the future of podcasting at the time. It was just right. like, oh yeah, right. we're going in and um, we're, we're hitting everything on uh, 
on all cylinders. And so, yeah, it was uh, something that I never thought in 2023, you and I would still be here talking comic books. But um, speaking of that, so you got into comics in 1982. I don't want to, I don't want to date us here, uh, Peter, but that was the year I was born, 1982. Okay. Okay. Um, So I want to get your origin story. What was a young Rios like? What was he doing? How did he get into it? And then what, what made it stick? Like what hooked you for life? Right. Yeah. I think I've always been a big reader that started it. Right. I was also fortunate that in my family, comics weren't unknown. So my mother used to read little, little Lulu comics. Oh, yes. Yes. My uncle grew up with the Marvel age. So all throughout the 60s and 70s, my uncle was reading, not collecting, but reading comics. Somewhere in the late 70s, uh, for one of my birthdays, uh, he decided to go get a whole bunch of farmer's market comics with the cover slashed off. And most of them were late 70s, Bronze Age Marvel and a bunch of DC and some horror comics. And he put them in a, a, a a cardboard beer box and just gave them to me. And I just, they're all gone. I mean, I shredded (laughs) them, right? I was a kid, you know, I was barely 10 years old. I don't, I wasn't even 10 years old. Um, so from there, I was really getting into like Richie Rich comics. I loved those late seventies, early eighties, Richie Rich comics. And then, as you said, in 1982, that's when, the little mom and pop store down on the corner uh, had a spinner rack. And ni- October of 1982, that's when I picked off the first handful of comics that were coming out, you know, that week. And that's mm. when I got to realize, oh, comics come out every week. Oh. I could go down to the store and, um, you know, it was a, a an issue of Justice League of America and Marvel Team Up and... Captain Carrot and his amazing zoo crew. And about a year later in like mid to late 1983 is when I don't know where I was getting the money. I'll just throw that out there. (laughs) I was picking up anything I could Marvel, Marvel and DC because my little mom and pop um, corner store, which was called Sam's didn't, they didn't, have independence you know they they weren't part of the retail chain they were just i guess they were sort of considered like a newsstand almost Mm. so they were only really getting marvel and dc so that that was it that was that was the that was me becoming a comic book reader and then eventually i would become a comic book collector and that that story warms my heart especially the spinner racks i i have fond memories of uh the the late 80s and spinner racks in particular i remember picking up crisis on infinite earth seven the Mm. superman uh holding supergirl and like to this day that is my favorite comic book cover of all time but it just had that lasting impact on me not quite Mm. not quite the cover you're talking about yes alex Alex ross Ross interpretation yeah yes man like just that i mean that as a kid, it impacted me because I was like, what can make Superman cry? Like that was like, it'd be like seeing my dad cry. So um, yeah. that cover had a huge impact on me. Um, but yeah, I, I, it just, like I said, it just warms my heart to hear how people got into comics and then also sticking with it because I have a lot of friends that, oh yeah, they started reading it and a couple of years later just fell off and never got back into yeah. it. Um, so there's a select group of people that not only get into it, but are hooked on it for life. And I think uh, you are definitely part of that club. And I, I'm honored to be a part of it with you because uh, I don't think comics will ever leave my side again. I'm, I'm always going to have some type of comic format. And I'm going to I think I'm going to pass it down to my son now, which is very exciting to me. He's about to turn two next month. So he's not right. at the age yet where I can have a conversation with him and say, Hey, who's your favorite superhero yet? But I've been showing him moon girl and devil dinosaur and uh, trying to show him the Spider-Man, uh, the preschool Spider-Man thing that has Miles Morales and uh, Spider-Gwen on it. So 
hopefully one of these days him he and I can uh, have a heart to heart about who his favorite superheroes are. Um but yeah, I, Col- I, podcast collaboration, father yes, and son. Yes. Um so I also, like I said, not only were you an inspiration for me on comic books, but you're also an inspiration on podcasting. So I want to hear that tale and the story of how did you first hear about podcasting? And then how did, I think of all time, Comic Geek Speak is my number one favorite podcast um, Awesome. out of everything. So how did that podcast come together? So I was fortunate to be a part of two different groups of friends that were into comics. One of them was during the 80s, during my middle school and high school years. And, uh, you know, and and what I learned from hearing from people and um, over the years on CGS is comics used to be, for a lot of people, a very solo hobby. Maybe they would talk to people at the comic store or they would go to a convention, but mostly it was... I had nobody to talk to about comics. I was sort of fortunate that I, like I said, I had two groups. Um, And then in the 90s is when I met the group that would eventually become Comic Geek Speak. And it was all sent, both groups were centered around Golden Eagle Comics, which I'm sure you heard a lot about over the years on CGS here in Reading, Pennsylvania. And the CGS guys, we would hang out at that store hours hours and hours girlfriends would call and say where are you you know um uh so that formation of of friends and we spent a lot of time outside like um, outside of the comic store at each other you know at people's weddings at, at parties at holidays um it eventually morphed into brian who is the the real sort of founder of comic geek speak reading an article in Wired Magazine about podcasting in late 19, uh, 2000, uh, yeah, late 2004 and calling me up and saying he knew I I had moved back to Reading at that time. And he knew that I had some time on my hands and he said, I want to do a podcast. It's going to be called comic geek speak. We're going to talk about comics. The only thing I know I want to do is I want to do a trivia segment because we we were already knee deep into comic book trivia for many years. <laughs> and he said, otherwise, let's just figure it out. We recorded two episodes in one day. We were both sharing one microphone, like, <laughs> like literally between us. It was right between us. And this was before podcatchers. This was before smartphones, you know, or to a, to a big degree. Um, it was before iTunes. We mm-hmm. were a couple of months before YouTube, I think. Um, and we recorded two episodes and we put it out in March of, uh, what was it? March 7th, I think is our anniversary of 2005. And it, we just, we just were like, okay, this is a thing we're doing now. And as you mentioned, we, we brought in a lot of that golden Eagle crew one at a time, two at a time, a bunch of us would be there. Um, but Brian and I would, we would also do our own episodes too. And we were lucky that we got in early. There were other comic book podcasts at the time. Um, uh, probably the, the one that was, the most dedicated to comic books that had started, I think on January 1st, 2005, that was Augie DeBleek's pipeline podcast. Oh yes, yes, yes. Um, and then there were others, uh, but for some reason, what we had at the comic store translated into those conversations. And we used to always say, we talk about comics before the mics go on. (laughs) We talk when the mics go on and then we wind up talking after. And that, ensemble and we were all very different right we some people were marvel heavy some people were dc heavy um we were generationally different by a number of years Mm. uh depending on who was on the show and by cgs episode 25 we decided this is an ensemble show it's no longer just brian and i plus whoever it's it's whoever's in the room 
how many years later and the show is still going on with different hosts but actually some of the originals are back again and um we were very very fortunate to get in early and to have a, a i think a, a very a quality show because we weren't a zoo crew we weren't mm. trying to be a radio we're going to make jokes we were trying to really talk about what we loved and we argued and we said we didn't like things and we said we did like things and we started doing interviews so that readers could actually hear what these creators sound like um it was it was lightning in a bottle for for that first year and um it's amazing that it's still going on yeah that's actually something that was big for me what you said about being able to hear those creators and the the thing that always sticks out to me is the pronunciation of names that I had never heard before. Like I see, see their names on paper, um, George Perez, like that mm -hmm. is one that it just, it's cemented in my brain because of listening to CGS and saying, oh, I don't, I never said these names out loud before. I never put a face to the, the names or I never heard their yeah. voices before. So, yeah, that was huge for me. I remember that. Um, I was going to, let's see, I was going to uh, Arizona State University, and I used to commute from my house to the bus stop uh, of the parking lot and then take the bus to campus. So I had all this time on my hands, and I was just listening to uh, podcasts. So that was one for me that, like I said, CGS was always my number one, I always put it at the top. And that was back when you had the iPods. So you had to download the podcast and, and sync it to your iPod and then bring it with you. It wasn't like today and streaming and everything. But yeah, man, that, that brings back some good memories uh, that I hadn't thought about in a while. Um, speaking of good memories, I, I also wanted to get your take on current comics today. Like in 2023, with digital and all these multimedia things, you know, we've got, whether it's video games or animation or podcasts, we've got audio podcast of old man Logan now and things like that, like things we never had before. Um, do you think comics in 2023 are in a good place, a bad place? Uh, in between place, like what's your take on it specifically um, from, from where you're sitting? Yeah, I, I tend to think that comics have gone back to being a niche again. I mean, they've always been a very low ladder, rung, rung of the ladder hobby. Um, Marvel movies and Marvel entertainment has become such a, a, a machine and a monster and a, and a, you know, just a driving cultural um, touchstone of entertainment, family entertainment, communal entertainment. Um, and I, and I really do mean Marvel movies. I don't just mean superhero movies because mm. yeah, you know, we have the boys, we have DC movies, Marvel movies have just really kind of captured the, the energy, right? Yes. Um, it doesn't translate into comics. I feel like, uh, comics are again, for the hardcore comic book readers. I, I think somewhere in the, in the early 2000s with podcasting, comics really were excelling. Marvel and DC were competing. Image was competing. We were getting Walking Dead. Eventually we would get Saga. You know, like the, we would get these events and titles that were helping the industry. Even the New 52, which, you know, we know what that history is, but at the time, retailers were really behind those first few months and they were yeah. talking about how they were getting that was getting people back into comics mm. into the store marvel now the first wave was that right. that was getting people into comics and into the store you're right we have digital i never thought i would be reading <laughs> mostly digital and I have a DC platform that I can pay once a year and I can read current comics a month later than when they're printed. Um, it has really changed. And I think Marvel and DC, I think they're struggling to be relevant. Um, I don't mean that on a cultural or a social level. I just mean in a, 
physical level. Like, mm. hey, here are comics. I mean, DC tried to get them into Walmart for a while. Um, we just had a flash trailer where at the end of it, they said, if you like this flash trailer, go read these comics, right? Is that going to translate? Sometimes. I mean, for the I think for one of the first times when James Gunn did his big, here's our gods and monster slate, suddenly Amazon is running out of Supergirl. And yeah. DC now has to print more authority and creature commandos, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really interesting to see the needle move mm -hmm. a, a, more than maybe it has ever done before. So the print one, the print, however, and, and when I say print, I mean digital as well. The, the publishing side of it, I should say, um, I think it's, it, it's, it's still fun to read. I don't necessarily know if I'm as excited as I was in the eighties, mm. sometime in the nineties, in the 2000s, you know, I think in the 2000s, that was my last big sort of like push of like excitement. I, I'm all for Dawn of DC, you know, the new thing they're doing. I know Marvel will probably do something in answer to that eventually. Is it really, they're not having the same numbers. It's unfortunate. Um, I think the creativity is there. And maybe it's because creators now can go to Image and, and Vault and Boom Studios, you know, so we don't have to center too much on the big two or the, mm. even the big five anymore. So I don't know, you know, I don't know what you think about that. But for me, I think there were more exciting times in comics, but it is a heck of a time to be a comic book fan when it comes to all that other other media. Yeah, I'm a hundred percent in agreement with you where there's comic book video games that I'm excited to play. There's, you know, like I said, podcasts, there's audio books, there's all kind of um, Disney plus shows and uh, HBO max shows and, and all these type of things. And the, the reading side, I'm, I'm still trying to keep up, you know, I'm still trying to read as much as I can. Um, but it's like you said, very niche and it's very difficult to get beyond that core group of hardcore fans. I'm with this show, I'm trying to, to spread as much joy as I can and say, Hey, I love reading comics. You <laughs> should read comics. So that's also one of my goals of having uh, different people on. And um, one of the criteria, I always say, does this person love comics and, and will they spread the gospel? So that's one of those things that, I always I find interesting, but I wonder if it's going to be, you know, similar to novels where novels were the only entertainment at one point. And right. when once we had all these other things taking our attention away, novels are still there. People are still writing books, but I feel like there's a core group of people that are going to buy an Amazon Kindle and, and read all the time versus the people who are the youngsters who are growing up today, you know, reading isn't necessarily the most popular thing. Now it's social media, it's TikTok, it's Instagram, Twitter. So content. yeah, content, um, which I think lowers the attention span. And it's like, it's, you're tr always trying to keep up with everything coming out. I don't, I don't know if that's such a good thing for our mental health, but <laughs> I do like um, the, the optimism of looking at, okay, even if it's not superhero stuff, um, I think actually uh, similar to you, I'm not really too excited about too many, you know, events coming out or things like that. It's more, I like following creators now yeah. and yeah. what are they, this creator is going to go over to image and, and tell a horror story, or this creator is going to go over and tell a crime story. So, those are things that I'm excited about. And Brian K. Vaughn has always been my favorite. You mentioned Saga earlier, and it's still, I think, the best comic that is coming out. And nice. if they could just, you know, if we just get more sagas, uh, we can get more people reading. But I, w I also look at manga, and I think about that audience and the way that that is marketed and the way that I feel like it's easier to get into series over there. So I'm also in the, out of the corner of my eye looking at that and saying, man, I wish American comics 
could be more like Japanese comics um, to a certain extent. I mean, that's such a different culturally. They are just more in favor of that kind of material. Yes. Whereas comics in our, as you know, comics in our culture, they're just disposable. You know, yeah. they might as well just be the Sunday funnies in, right. in a newspaper strip. Um, and, and you're right. I mean, I am still excited about, I mean, one of the things I've, I've learned to do over the past couple months or even the past year or so is to fall back in love with my collection. Why am, why do I have 30 some long boxes of comics if I'm not <laughs> going to read them? Right? Yes. Yes. And even if they're current comics that maybe I'm not so excited about, I have an entire backlog of my own comics plus what's on like the DC app that I have never read before where I can read decades of comics that I've never read and always heard good things about. So my excitement to read comics is still there. So you know, I, I, I don't want, um, I don't want to bring, you know, your goal <laughs> down. My excitement <laughs> is definitely there because you can always look backwards. You can always look backwards and they are just as relevant as anything that's being produced today. So, uh, yeah, I think you're right. It's how do you get people excited about, uh, an activity that you can't just sit back and do. You can't, you can sit back and watch a movie, but you can't sit back and read. Somebody has got to turn the page. Somebody you got to, you know, pay attention to the sequential art and right. does the story make sense and the continuity or one book comes out one month and then it comes out the other, next month and you got to remember. So yeah, that's, that's hard. That's hard. Yeah. There's a, a, uh, there's a lot of hurdles involved in it, but you know, as, as I'm sure you're, uh, the same as me, it's like the, it's worth it to go through those things and, and to get the end product of, this is just another form of storytelling. And yeah. to me, I think this is my favorite medium for storytelling. I love stories, whether it's my dad telling me stories from when he was a kid or if I'm watching a movie, playing a video game. The narrative is always the, the thing that drives me in. Okay, how do I – how can I relate to these characters? How can I go on this journey? And comics, you know, the – I'll always – love those those Scott McCloud understanding comics, reading comics and making comics. Those are like my favorite text material to to give to people and say this is why comics is is amazing. It's what happens between the panels, what's happening, what your mind fills in. Um so I I always love that thinking about the psychology of comics and thinking about what makes them unique and different from everything else but like you said it's it's a very active uh medium versus passive with like tv and movies yeah. um and actually what you said about going back and reading some of your collected material that is something i've been doing recently too i was actually i was i was just on another podcast and they were to, oh and this makes me feel old because they were reading ultimate spider-man for the first time oh, wow. and i was telling them about like when it was coming out and in 2000, this was happening in, in the world and, and they, you know, they had no reference. These, these were like, um, the, I want to say they were elementary school at the time when it was coming out. So uh, they just didn't have the same reference markers that I had, but I was rereading it just for that podcast. And I was like, man, this still holds up. It's still, there's a timeless aspect about Bagley's art and the Bendis retelling of this the peter parker um origin story and it was just like man I, I i now i remember why i love this so much why it got me back into comics why it it made bendis my favorite creator um at the time and i was like man i kind of don't recognize bendis today versus bendis when he was writing that ultimate spider-man but oh, yeah. it is fun to go back and and uh and go through the 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 history of our collections. Um, yeah. But I think um, there is a, like I said, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to look at whatever the future holds, whether it's digital comics being like a hybrid of TV and like 
there was in the early 2000s, the mid 2000s, they were trying those things of, um, man, I can't remember the name of them, but they were like they infinite comics. Yes. Yes. Is. That's so right. That's yeah, right. And it kind of moved a little bit. Something that was a, a combination and it wasn't yeah. a comic and it wasn't a animated thing. And it was something in between. I'm, I'm wondering if, if any of that is ever going to catch on to the point where it's like the, the panel to panel stuff has always existed for the print material. Like you said, now going into digital, is it ever going to evolve as the digital continues and the way that we consume the media is just the highway. And, you know, we, we want that content and not necessarily the, the way that the content is delivered to us. So that's the kind of stuff that I'm interested in um, to see where it goes in the future. Um, I think some of that relies on whoever creates the next cool app or technology so that comics could be, uh, you know, 10 steps above what those infinite comics were not quite motion comics, but not quite animation, but sort of animation and, and, you know, to, not to get Star Trekky with it, but <laughs> you could open, you could, you could have a panel of artwork and you could touch a character and, and open it and find histories or read another story, you know, so that it becomes almost multi-tier. Mm. Um, not, and again, not quite a video game, but sort of like a, an old, you know, I don't know, like Mist or Riven or I, yeah. I don't know, like just something, something a little more interactive, I think is, might be a possible future. But again, comic, they're not going to invent that technology. So somebody <laughs> has to invent that technology. Yeah, man, whoever's listening to this right now, invent it and, and uh, let us, let us experience it because uh, I definitely want that future of, you know, as we were growing up, Tron and things like that, like the, the, what we thought the eighties future was going to be. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to be interesting of information. Like you said, touching a character and getting the whole biography and getting the history. It's like having an interactive Wikipedia right there and being just having the access to more knowledge of storylines, characters, histories, and things like that. I think actually that would be really good for just the, the format of comics right. in Marvel general. tried it with those little AR codes. Oh, or, right. Yeah. Remember yeah. Those? But forgot you know, about still, that. You needed more than one device, you know, it wasn't quite the same. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it has to be convenient for the person. It can't be like, Oh, yeah. I got to do all these things. I got to jump through all these hoops. Yeah, that's right. I think about virtual reality. It's like having, or even like 3d, you know, having to have glasses on or having to have a headset on, it just hinders you. It's, doesn't feel as natural as you just experiencing things out in the world. So yes, yeah, just we got to get over those those hurdles before we can get to that stuff. But I'm excited for the future of comic books and I'm also excited about the future of the Daily Rios. Uh could you tell me about the the genesis of the Daily Rios? How did that come about and then what you're currently doing on the daily reels. So the daily reels is, is in year 11. So I'm about ready to wrap up year 11 in the middle, in the summer of 2023. Nice. Um, it started because I had left producing CGS, uh, because as you said earlier, you know, you get busy with, I was getting busy with work and, and theater opportunities and Swedish um, fish. I was, yes, yeah, Swedish fish. I wasn't <laughs> living in Reading. I was living in Philadelphia. So, it was getting to be too much. And then a year later, I, you know, the podcasting bug is just as strong as the comic book, you know, <laughs> yes. collector in me. Yes. And I was like, okay, what, what could I do that could be different from what I was doing before? Maybe something that could be unique to whatever was going on at the time. And I thought about, you know, this was 2012. I thought about, the original way, the original reason why people did podcasting was to kind of be a little voyeuristic, to give a little bit about their lives. Mm -hmm. One of the more most popular podcasts at the time, I don't know if it still is, was Keith and the Girl. It was about a husband and wife team. Right, um, right. I think that was the name of the title. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. 
And I also wanted the show to be bite-sized. I didn't want a two-hour show. I wanted something very quick. Again, like the original podcasting, an audio blog. So, And then I took on the crazy challenge of doing five shows a week, <laughs> which we used to do on CGS, but those were, you know, you had more than one person to rely on. Right. So I decided to came up with the name, the daily Rios, because it was going to be more of like a personal journal than just a comic book podcast. And it was a, an experiment to just see if I could do this for a year, five days a week. And it worked for that first year. I've never done it again because it was <laughs> just, sort of crazy. Um, by the end there, I was running on fumes, trying to come up with topics and all that. Um, so I kept the Daily Rios thing. Sometimes I think, you know, okay, it doesn't have to be just about podcasting. It could be a blog post. It could be an Instagram post, whatever. I always have good intentions. Um, what I found now in the past, uh, I'm now in my second year of doing a digest format, which is technically like a daily thing, but instead of coming out five days a week, it's one podcast with five different segments and it's still sometimes recorded daily. I just don't release it daily. Hence the name digest. Mm. Um, it gives me a little bit of freedom. It makes me very concise because I want these segments to be no more than like 20 minutes long each. If that, um, and I'm having a lot of fun with that because I get to talk about comics. I get to talk about theater. I get to talk about movies, TV shows, trailer reactions, new comics that are coming out, older comics, um, news, you know, just I can do anything and everything. I really love that format. Um, it works for me. And for the future of the Daily Rios, I'm always wanting to do... Um, you said about community before. I, I would love to do more things like you're doing, bringing people on, spreading the good word of, of comics, um, putting spotlight on, you know, I'm Puerto Rican, so putting spotlight on Hispanic or Latinx creators. Um, it's always something I keep saying I want to do and I never, you know, jump into it, but the, the, the desire is there to do that. And to just keep, spreading talking about comics keep you know arguing about comics debating about <laughs> comics loving <laughs> comics um the daily reels is it's really sort of like a potpourri of just anything i'm thinking about during the day i think some of the reason why i did the digest was also to factor in what you said about social media you know short attention span if you don't like this segment just go to the next one um uh, and just put out something that people, people are still working. They're still at their desk. They still need something to listen to. Um, so, you know, 10 years in on the daily Rios and, uh, I, I don't think I'll slow down anytime soon. I mean, I've managed to build up a small community and it's been great. Nice. Um, and, and I'm just excited to see wherever my whims take me next. <laughs> Nice. Excellent. Well, I'm a hundred percent appreciative for um, everything that you have put out into the world so far and everything that you are going to continue to put out into the world. I think you are one of the most positive people I've seen online. And, and I feel like you have this um, magnetic personality. Like I, when, when I hear you speak and when I hear you talk about things, it makes me like those things. It's like, oh, he's talking about this and uh, there's a positive aspect to it. And there's there's so much negativity online and there's so much clickbait these days where it's like, yeah. oh, everything, you have to hate everything and everything is bad. And that's the only thing that gets clicks. But um, I'm always looking at people that are fair and balanced and, hey, I like some things. And I don't like some things. I'm not, you know, I don't love everything. I don't hate everything. But it's that just feels more real to me and, and feels like more of a realistic thing. And and I feel like if I had grown up in your guys's area, I would have been we would have been friends. We would have been at the comic shop, Absolutely. hang it out. So um, I, I just have to say thank you to you, my friend, for everything that you have done so far and everything you will continue to do. Um, so thank you very much. I would like to let all of our audience know 
um, where everyone can find your work and where everyone can uh, can see your plays or or just just where can they find Peter Rios? The best place is the dailyrios.com. That's where I drop every podcast, every podcast appearance. Um, um, that's like a, a, a nice one-stop shop kind of thing. Uh, my Twitter is Peter J Rios. Uh, again, mostly talk about comics, but I talk about other things as well. Um, that's the best place to just sort of get an idea of who I am and what I'm thinking about. And th between the two of them, that's a nice overview of, of my work. Beautiful, my friend. Well, everyone out there who's listening to this or watching this right now, you can hear the sound of my voice. Go follow Peter J. Rios. You will not be disappointed, my friends. Um, thank you. Everyone out there, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I want to say that Peter loves comics, and you should too. <laughs> <laughs>